Good evening, everyone. I'm Carla Christopher, the host of Culture in Maine, and you are here for another fabulous episode. Now, today we're taking a very special trip over to our friends at York College for a conference that they put on over the summer. We've aired a few excerpts here and there, but we wanted to really take the time to put together a resource for artists, which is what the Impact Arts Conference is. Now, the Impact Arts Conference will be coming back again this summer, and registration starts soon, so we thought it was the perfect time to tell you a little bit more about it. The Cultural Alliance, which is our natural funding source and source of nonprofit activism for the arts here in York, pairs up with York College and presents this amazing full day long conference where speakers and artists and people involved in the business of art all come together with tons of great local talent to create, to educate educate, to learn, and to help us really move forward as an art community. If you weren't at the conference this year, you'll get to see a little bit about what it was like, but I promise you it is worth coming out. So make sure that you go and find the Cultural Alliance online, check out the Impact Arts Conference, and make sure that you see me there and say hi for the 2015. Sit back, relax, and enjoy your trip, your very condensed trip, through the Impact Arts Conference, presented by the Cultural Alliance. Culture and me. It is a place where the truth should be kept. The arts and music scene really shows what people are about. Share what's going on here in York. It makes you feel like a family. Local art has a face that most people can relate to. Our community up here that sticks together. Art is art. Great potential with great artists, poets, singers, writers, directors, filmmakers. It's fantastic. So everyone has a story to tell. That moment, you have to capture that moment and share it with the rest of the world. Showing something that maybe is not been seen before. Without art, what is this life? I am art. I've been art ever since I was born. It really adds a great deal to our community. We don't really need art to exist, but you need art to live. Culture main is important, and I think playing out is important, and playing open mics and playing wherever you can play. It's all about us all checking in with each other. My cohort, Kelly Giveaway, Kelly Gibson is our uh, director. She's the director of communications and engagement and the uh, kingpin of this conference, and we thank her for that. But we welcome you to the Impact Arts and Culture Conference, the first one-day professional development conference for creatives and those working in the arts and culture ever held in our region. Yeah. <laughs> and for those of you who are proud to join us here in New York, welcome, enjoy our city, and we're so happy to have you here. Change in New York over the past decade can be characterized as nothing less than phenomenal. And it, it emerged the simple realization that creativity has transformative powers. Creativity reflects the heart and soul of each of us, regardless of age, ethnicity, or stage in life. The Impact Arts and Culture Conference is one of the many programs the Culture Alliance is bringing to our community to continue this change and enhance its creative economic vitality. By collaboratively leading the cultural community and focusing resources to grow and develop the men and women working in arts and culture in our surrounding regions, we give them the tools to transform their communities. Community building programs like the Impact Arts and Culture Conference didn't happen with the efforts of just one organization, like the revitalization and cultural re re renaissance happening throughout York. This conference has been born to the collaborative efforts and help of many talented, creative people. I will also echo the mayor's welcomes to all that are attending today, and certainly to our First Lady of our Commonwealth. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for everything that you do for the arts in Pennsylvania and certainly in New York. You've been a great friend to York, uh, and I know uh, your uh, attendance on the PA Council of the Arts has also been very important. Patrick Dahlheimer here representing uh, the arts community, uh, infused from our city education uh, all the way up now to a successful future rock and roll. And Mr. Pulo, of course, who was one of the individuals that first met with ArtSpace way back when, when they came to do their feasibility study 
uh, hosted a lunch for them at the Yorktown Hotel and was one of the initial uh, individuals from our philanthropic and also our arts community uh, to talk to them. But uh, very briefly, and you know, the mayor really highlighted all of the things that I would echo, um, but obviously uh, this is a huge uh, announcement for York. This is very exciting and it is pretty darn cool. So I, I'm really excited to be here to uh, help uh, announce, make this announcement work with ArtSpace, but um, you know, I think it has been said often and frequently that if you inject a community with art and artisans, the return on investment is immeasurable. I think that's true. I think it's been proven across our country. It's certainly been proven in our Commonwealth. It's been proven here in New York. And we have made tremendous strides in New York in recent years. Uh, we're fortunate to have a strong creative foundation in our community. We have a long history of, of excellent artists and artisans, craftsmanship and industrial ingenuity. Our artists and our arts organizations are professional, are creative, they're growing. Our business philanthropic and government leaders are entirely supportive and collaborative with the arts community. And these together form a very strong, very powerful foundation in York and in central Pennsylvania and in our creative sector. Culture absolutely builds community. And we're fortunate to have many cultural anchors in our county. Many cities employ the arts as economic generators, as the mayor mentioned, but in York, we have done this rather successfully over time. Building off great institutions such as the Strand Capital Performing Arts Center, our historic farmers markets, the Heritage Trust. In 2005, I always think it's important to, to try to step back and, and look holistically at how far we've come as a community, because we can get mired in the day-to-day, -day, uh, sometimes negative news cycle, no offense to the media present, um, but it's important sometimes to take that step back. In 2005, Mayor John Brenner appointed an Arts District Task Force. Joanne Riley, the former uh, President and CEO of the Cultural Alliance, uh, chaired that with Frank Dittenhafer, a local architect. In 2006, the Artist Homestead Program was launched. Uh, we've seen several years of public art projects from our very whimsical Gear Garden to Lafayette to PAL to the industrial art along Beaver Street and George Street. Our City Jazz Series was launched under Mayor Bracey, as well as a jazz festival. Cap Live, live music at the Strand Capitol has been launched. First Fridays, second Saturdays, Teen Fourth Fridays have all exploded in our, in our city. The Market View Arts Center was constructed and now houses York College of Pennsylvania's senior fine arts students. It houses the Pennsylvania Arts Experience. And this was built through a RACP grant that Governor Corbett had authorized. So it's important to see the long trail that we have made. The Pennsylvania Arts Experience is in there daily uh, and they represent all of the artists and the arts organizations throughout our county. Obviously, York College. Most recently, uh, the Parliament in the Royal Square development has become a haven in our city for our creatives. York showcases our creatives in a constant open air gallery. Our city is an educator of our youth the importance of our community's culture cannot be overstated. The benefits continue to concentrate a continued investment on cultural enhancements, and they pay significant social dividends on into the future. So today's announcement is obviously very positive. It is done through the collective work through our community, as the mayor had mentioned, and this will have an incredible and an exponential economic and community development impact on our community and our county and on central Pennsylvania. So it is a great honor to be here. It is truly exciting. I would also echo the mayor's, I told you so. So I really want to thank everyone for being here today. With the mission to bring all the arts to all the people all over the country. So, you know, no big deal. Um, <laughs> the, the small mission. So, you know, this is a pretty small group. I'd actually love to start by hearing a little bit more about um, the kinds of constituencies that you're representing. So I'm going to throw a few out, but we'll see. We'll see if I'm on base here. Do we have any educators, especially people from the college? Fantastic. Okay, great. How about students? Anyone from the local arts organizations? Great. Okay. Where are some others? Where are you coming from? Fantastic. Okay. Anyone else? Great, okay, and so we have some people from outside of York specifically, that's great. So today um, I'm here to talk to you ostensibly about arts and economic prosperity, but on my way into town, I saw your beautiful change sculpture and I've heard about, uh, I've heard tell of, of frozen butter in the winter, is that true? Big butter, okay, 
Good, I'm not wrong. So um, I also wanted to include a couple of slides of just some wonderful art that's happening here in York. So your Chalk It Up Festival. Um, this is Wayne White, uh, an artist who I believe had a public art um, here at York College, is that right, uh, last year. And I want you to remember this for later. This particular picture is actually of a couple from New York visiting. Um, and uh, dream right, so theater for young people as well. So these are all inspiring pictures. They tell us about what the arts do for our community. Um, so I'd like to know how many of you got into the arts because of your deep passion for economic impact. <laughs> okay, one, all right, awesome. Well, that's great. Um, most of us, not so much. Um, and we are a pragmatic nation. We are a nation built on Puritans. We are a nation that occasionally has a few people, I don't know if you've met them, some of them work in, uh, in government, some of them work in businesses, some of them even work in the arts, who don't necessarily uh, take the idea of the intrinsic value of the arts as the most um, persuasive argument about why we should be funding the arts, why the arts provide really important impact on our community. We understand their vitality. We understand why they make our communities more beautiful, more wonderful places. But I'd like to challenge you today to think about the arts a little bit differently, maybe in the way that you're already thinking about them, um, but that not all of us do. And coming up with a few new points, a few new ways of opening those doors, a new language for talking about the arts in our communities. Uh. I want to tell you a little bit about uh, where I came from and what brought me here today. Uh, I was born and raised here in New York, PA. Uh, I started a band called Live about uh, 20, 20 some odd years ago. Uh, to give you some highlights or lowlights, uh, we're at about 30 million records sold. Uh, Rolling Stone Artist of the Year, Billboard Artist, Artist of the Year, uh, three number one records, a whole bunch of top 10 singles and 20 years in the business. So uh, it's come a long way. Uh, we started the band in eighth grade at Edgar Fall Smith here in the city, uh, York City School District. Uh, we were all taking private lessons from uh, our school instructor, Don Karn. And Don Karn had a fabulous idea that I should start a band. And uh, I thought, wow, that's a pretty cool idea. I started a band. He said, uh, you should probably get in the talent show. We went in the talent show and uh, won $25 and thought that, you know, this is it. I've just realized my dream, you know, if I can stand on stage and uh, perform and uh, get $25 a night, you know, I, uh, I'd be living a, a grand life. So from then on, I think I had realized my dream. My dream was to use my guitar and my artistic outlet to communicate to others and to eventually travel the world and things beyond. The, uh now, the first lady said a little earlier that there seems to be something in the water in New York, and I would certainly agree with that. This is a, a, a very energized community, and uh, my colleague Anna Grocott right there, taking, <laughs> taking something for Facebook or something, um, <laughs> Twitter, whatever it is. Uh, so, <laughs> That, that's, that's why we have people like Anna, because people like me don't know. <laughs> so we're delighted to be here. This is my third trip to, to York, and, and uh, I, I think it's a, it's a very cool city, and I'm, I'm hoping that what has begun here will, will continue on. I'm going to give you a short presentation that just tells you a little bit about art space for those of you who don't know something, and then a little bit uh, of, about uh, what the survey did and, and what we discovered. Um, first of all, we always acknowledge our, our partners, the City of York and uh, uh, Representative Schreiber uh, from the uh, uh, House of Representatives. 
uh, about ArcSpace. We were established in 1979 in Minneapolis as a nonprofit uh, advisory entity uh, to help artists who were being gentrified out of the warehouse district of Minneapolis and needed uh, to find new space. And ArtSpace was created as, to help them find new space. Uh, after about a decade of this, it, it became apparent that uh, the, the same artists were being gentrified out of the next space and the next space and the next space. And the board of directors made a really courageous decision to uh, put ArtSpace in the business of real estate development so that we could own buildings and, and keep them affordable over time. And that's what has happened since the late 1980s. Uh, we have become the national leader in what is called creative placemaking. Uh, creative placemaking is defined in, in a number of ways, but is essentially making uh, important uh, uh, cultural uh, areas, districts with, within a community, and, uh, and as we see it, leveraging those cultural assets to bring about social change and, and other changes that are important for cities. We're based in Minneapolis. As I said, we have offices in, in five uh, other cities around the country. Uh, last week, we completed our 36th uh, project. Uh, it was our number three in Seattle, uh, and our first real transportation-oriented development right next to a light rail uh, station in Seattle. In 14 states altogether, plus the District of Columbia, another 10 projects uh, under construction or in development, including New York City, uh, one in Honolulu, Hawaii, one in New Orleans, in Treme, the, uh, the famous uh, black neighborhood of, of New Orleans, and um, the one that I think is really, really fascinating, we're doing a project on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota. Uh, altogether, we've done about 1,200 plus affordable live work units that serve more than 2,000 artists and their families, and something like three and a half million square feet if you put it all together. We are a nonprofit. We have a mission. The mission is to create, foster, and preserve affordable space for artists and arts organizations. And we find that all three of these things are, are essential to the way our art space operates. Here's where we work. I don't know how well you can see it, but um, the, uh, we've, we've done projects all around the country. Uh, the, the black ones are projects in operation. The, uh, uh, the, the green ones are in development, and the gray ones are places where we've done consulting of various kinds. And the red circle, obviously, is, is uh, marks where York is. So that's art space in a very small nutshell. And the community that you find are like-minded people who are into making things who might have been doing so on their own, in their own studio, or might not have been doing it at all, because let's be honest, sometimes it's hard to find that space. So, what ends up happening is this beautiful incubation event, which I'm sure you've heard of for different startup businesses, you get different people in the same room talking to each other, and weird things start to happen. The same is true of this, it's sort of an economic jumpstart. That's how our company got founded. We didn't know each other before we all went to the same makerspace, saw that we were each doing cool things, decided to collaborate, and then eventually decided to form a company together. So it's an economic driver, it's a place that artisans can work to explore their craft, to learn new things, and to practice their business. Um, so in the long and short of it, that's what I do, that's what makerspaces are good for. A community resource, a resource for artists, and then ideally in a perfect world, something that gives back to the very community that they're supporting. And I always thought that writers, artists, uh, dancers, Actors, maybe, were the most interesting, <laughs> smartest, obviously most creative, but certainly um, the people that I would want to spend most of my time with. As well as hosting a very well attended public community meeting as well, the feasibility study returned a conclusion that a potential artist housing project was in fact feasible. The next step was to scientifically test the market. In January of this year, we launched an online market study. Many may remember the launch party at the Strand Capitol. The survey sought feedback from qualified artists living within the region. We had a very positive response to the survey, which closed in March. So we gather today happily to report on those scientific findings. 
I have the exciting and enjoyable task of reporting the very favorable market studies show that reassuringly, our market in York could sustain the development of up to 56 residential units designed for, marketed to, and inhabited by working artists. 56 units in the city, that is very favorable and a positive report. take this chance now to say I told you so. <laughs> Kidding aside, this reinforces what we now know and believe and have witnessed in our city for many years. Because of the hard work of many to include the Cultural Alliance and its member agencies, because of a strategic focus, because of so many talented and creative artists, our York dynamic cultural scene continues to grow and improve. Our arts and cultural liaison and former poet laureate was personally responsible for getting our artists to take part in this process as well. So we envision art space as another evolution of York's artistic community. Um, thanks for inviting me. I'm truly honored to be here and after that huge, fantastic, um, inspirational stuff you've all been talking about, I'm getting a bit jealous that I don't live in York. That's <laughs> so we'll have to change that. Um, so yeah, um, I'm here to uh, share with you the Little Letter Project. Um, in 2001, um, my family and I made a big drastic change. We had spent 12 years living in the city of New Orleans and we moved out to the country. And when I say country, I mean country. 3,000 people live in my town and we live on acreage and um, there's not even a Starbucks, it's ridiculous. So, <laughs> yeah, really. so um, at the same time, it was really primarily so that um, after 20 years of being a graphic designer and photographer and teaching for uh, 10 years, I just wanted to go back to grad school. I was the mature student. Um, so I enrolled in Vermont College of Fine Arts in the MFA graphic design and I knew, uh, you know, I've, I've always wanted to do the MFA but I didn't want to do the MFA and just churn out a bunch of design and say, yeah, I've got an MFA. I just wanted to do something more meaningful, you know, I spent 10, 15 years working and designing um, great stuff really, I mean, you know, logos, brochures, that type of stuff, but it, it was just something not quite as meaningful with just working with a client or a couple of people or five, you know, um, people in the audience. So, so I wanted to do something a little bit bigger. Did not know it was going to involve litter. I hate litter. <laughs> I cannot stand it. Clearly, I'm not originally from Louisiana, y'all. So, um, and there is litter in England, but there's some very hard and fast rules about it. So I sort of grew up and. Um, it was sort of drilled into me that you don't know, throw that stuff on the floor, it's naughty, you don't do that. You know? so, um, so moving to Louisiana, there's a huge litter problem and I didn't realise it quite so much until I was living an hour and a half north of New Orleans, which may be crazy to you, anybody who's been to New Orleans and saying it's certainly not the cleanest city. Um, but in the country, there's something about the space, I don't know, people were driving along the highway throwing it on the highway and all of a sudden I had a patch of that highway. You know, I had like a mile stretch along the highway and every week I was picking up litter and it pissed me off, <laughs> honestly. So combined with that and um, going to Vermont, which is very clean and has no litter apparently, um, going up there and explaining this problem, you know, we had an independent study program who said, why don't you work on that graphic design problem? So this, I'm here to share my story. So that is my highway, my highway, part of my highway. Um, so I'd always been pretty much boarding on obsessed with typography. Um, I was the kind of kid that was, you know, age 10, all the kids were playing outside and I was inside drawing out letter forms, that type of thing. So I knew, I knew that my life would involve type for some way. Type and litter, not. Never saw that connection until two years ago. So, so I went back home um, after my decision to make a litter project, and um, it all sounded really, really good in Vermont. You know, you're around artists and <laughs> environmentalists and people that are really forward thinking, and then you get to rural, sleepy, y'all, deep south Louisiana, and I'm stuck in the middle, and I'm like, uh, yeah. So I was going to make something with litter and typography. How's that going to work? Um, I have two children. The great thing about having young kids, right here is my four-year-old Samuel. 
at the time. The great thing about them is they do not question your sanity. <laughs> so <laughs> I said to him, we're going to we're gonna go to the hardware store and we're going to buy some wire of some kind and we're going to pick up some trash and we're going to make stuff. And he was like, cool. So um, that's what you're seeing right here. I went up there and I, um, so May 9th, 2012, this was the dilemma I was facing. And I'd also told a lot of people that I was going to do something, so the pressure was on. Um, when I say I'm an artist and a designer, I use that term really loosely because I've been doing a lot of stuff on the computer. I haven't made things with my hands, other than a cake. So, um, so I went to the store and I bought some chicken wire, as you see. Samuel's still totally into it. He's like, yeah, let's do it. We're making it. Let's make a letter. Um, so this is really what happened. It, um, started prototyping it. Um, actually having a lot of fun. Litter is disgusting. It's hot in Louisiana and um, it smells and I don't like that. But um, like I said, I, I, was, I, was in, I was invested at this point. And I kind of like the absurdity of it. You know, it was a little different to, you know, teaching in design and working on a um, computer coming up with a nice polished logo. I was like, now I'm on my back porch with trash and, and chicken wire. So, so really these are, at this point, two years later, I feel slightly cringing when I look at this because I'm like, they're so beautiful now. Um, but I felt like it was important to share this because at the time I was so happy with this. I was like, these things are so cool. Um, but not for the reasons, not for the reasons that I originally thought. So the first um, initial change for me when I started working on this was I started sharing it. I haven't been a shared type person. You know how the British are, you know, we like to keep ourselves to ourselves and we don't hold and we don't share our work traditionally. So, um, so this, was a di this was a different thing, you know, I started working on this and I had some great classmates who said, share that stuff, show us what we're doing. So um, yeah, there was something very freeing about that and throwing something out there before it was even finished, you know, just to see what people said. So what had happened here was I started using the, the larger chicken wire it actually ended up being very easy and fun to work with. I was covered in scratches um, because I couldn't quite get the whole um, uh, having gloves on. Um, so I did it all by my hands. So, um, so what happened was I started posting these pictures and all my friends and classmates are graphic designers and they said, well, what about serifs? And how about some thinking about more structure and some more beautiful type? So um, I was like, it's chicken wire, people. <laughs> it's glitter and chicken wire. Okay. Let's think about some beautiful parts. Uh, we tend to work in larger cities, but we also work in smaller cities. Um, our smallest project is uh, 10 units in Fergus Falls, Minnesota, population 13,000. And, um, and we've done some others uh, in the 20s and uh, and 30s um, and now we'll we will see what we have to say about the arts market uh, in uh, York PA the survey itself is it's just it's just an online survey that that uh, we, we created years ago because we sort of felt we needed to know how big the market was in any community where we were where we were going to be this is incidentally from our uh, 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 preliminary feasibility. That's that's York City Hall, and um, I forget the artist's name. I bet some of you know him. Soji. Soji. Thank you. Um, and um, so uh, over the years, we've conducted more than forty of these surveys, and we've reached twenty-five thousand plus artists. And uh, in addition, there, there, are, there are really two surveys. There's a survey of individual artists and a survey of arts organizations, which we did not do in, in New York. But when, when we do them, uh, altogether we've sur uh, surveyed a thousand or more uh, arts organizations, creative businesses, um, when, when we're specifically looking for um, uh, non-residential tenants for, for a project. The goal of the survey uh, the number one goal is to quantify the demand. 
um, we need to know how many uh, uh, projects, uh, how many uh, uh, live work units to build. Um, we need to know what other kinds of, of rental spaces, particularly studio spaces, to, uh, to include in the project and, uh, and commercial space when, when that's, uh, that's an issue. Uh, we try to articulate the concept as well. Um, the, it, often the city has a very good idea of, of you know, sort of where the project might be or what the needs are. I, I spoke about Santa Cruz where the problem was, was that the artists were leaving the community because they couldn't afford to live there and they wanted to preserve some of the historic tannery buildings and they wanted uh, places for artists to live and so they, they had a, a pretty thorough and complete agenda. Um, Sometimes that's often not the case, and so the, we try to articulate the concept of the project to be through the, through the uh, the survey. Um, we look for the kinds of, of spaces and features that artists uh, prefer. Uh, it will be immediately apparent that when you're talking about the Treme neighborhood of, of uh, New Orleans, which is sort of, uh, you know, you think of an artist, it's a, it's a member of, of a brass band. Uh, music came in very, very strong. And so when there are a lot of musicians, uh, one of the features that artists uh, ask for is soundproofing so that they, they can practice without disturbing their neighbors and vice versa. Um, and we also try to get a sense of who are the artists and, 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 and get a description of them. Uh, we want to know what their disciplines are for obvious reasons. Uh, we we want to know their current living and, and working arrangements because that will inform the nature of the project as well and their ability to pay. Um, some, sometimes, uh, even though there are a lot of artists who qualify uh, for one reason or another, uh, uh, an art space project is, is, is not something that, that they feel they can afford and we try to find that out uh, going in. Of the local attendees said that they would go somewhere else for an arts event. So you're losing another percentage of people if you don't have these arts events in your community. This is really important. This is where you can start really talking about the community vitality, the cultural vitality that the arts bring. They also bring cultural tourism. Uh, cultural tourism is a big buzzword right now, really important to city managers because people are so interested in authentic experiences, really experiencing a community for what it is in the arts and culture are such a big part of showing what are our communities about. So does it work? Well, you can say ah, everything has an economic impact. Why should we trust this one? Well, this is a pretty interesting and powerful list of partners we have and we list it on the back of all of our materials. Um, so you can see we're working with government, we've got the National Conference of State Legislatures, uh, the U.S. Conference of Mayors is a huge partner. They really understand how the arts impact locally. Mayors have been a, a great partner for us. Uh, National League of Cities and uh, NACO, the National Association of Counties. But then we also have business leaders, Conference Board, um, and the Business Civic Leadership Center. These are not people who are going to buy into something that's not rigorously tested. So the authority, the authenticity of this study uh, really comes through with these partners. And it's a useful way to talk about it with someone who may be a bit more skeptical. I come from Americans for the Arts. They're going to expect me to say that the arts have some impact. But some of these people, having them back it up, that's, that's a pretty useful way of thinking through this. But it's not the only way. So I want to take another, take another turn here and say we don't have to choose. We don't have to choose between economic impact and vitality and talking about the arts as having other kinds of social impact that are just as important. Economic impact is one lens, one way of looking at it. But this is another one. I think innovation is another pretty important buzzword right now, especially for those of us who've seen Silicon Valley, that HBO show. I. Uh, I don't know if anyone else has seen that, but um, innovation, uh, something big right now. Um, can anyone guess at what that is, what this picture is? You can just shout it out. A 
All right. Well, this is a picture of the artists who created this decoy holding it up. This is a balloon version of a tank, and uh, this is called the Ghost Army, Operation Fortitude. This was um, something that's actually been classified for a long time, recently became declassified. Uh, there was a special segment of the army that was dedicated to artists and creators and innovators coming in to create these kinds of decoys uh, to fool the Nazis into shooting at some very harmless balloon tanks. Uh, they saved thousands of lives doing this. And I bring this up because we know that artists are innovators in our communities. Artists can be useful and artists can make things and artists bring so much more than just beautiful things. They also bring an incredible amount of creativity and new ways of thinking into our communities. So today we have nine artisans who work in varied materials with differing backgrounds, skill sets, and experience, and we collaborate with Rudy and uh, in small clustered groups to uh, produce projects, whether it's the public streetscape works that you see here in downtown York, or uh, projects when we work with architects and designers. So this, this space is in existence. Um, we are looking to start in this fall in a wing of Rudy Art Glass, which gives us about 11,000 square feet. Um, and a lot of the tooling, uh, the power, the air compressors, uh, software are, are there in existence. We need to reconfigure the space, organize it, clean it up, and put in some fresh lighting um, and start. I said, you know, it's going to be hard for me to like envision this project and not be there. And he said, well, we'll just send you pictures and stuff. And I was like, well, I, uh... Are they going to be good pictures? Are they going to be high resolution? <laughs> 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 So anyway, I said, well, why can't I just go in there? You know, these people are not like hardened criminals or anything, are they? And they went, yes, Maria. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, uh, okay. So they're not like murderers or anything. Ah, yeah, it's possible. It's like, oh, so, a person who is a convicted felon who may or may not have hurt somebody created these beautiful <laughs> letters <laughs> that I got from an iPhone, not even an iPhone, a regular camera. Um, Phone. So I was floored. I thought this this is something. This is I mean this is not somebody in there that's just putting this together because they've been told to. This is an artist who's made a mistake in their life, but for whatever reason, but is skilled. You know. So this is when it got really exciting. Um, they went ahead and they wrapped it again. They wouldn't let me go in there. Um, so that was kind of a hard part of the project, you know, we were all sort of set back and everybody in my community is so relaxed and calm and, and oh, I'll be fine, y'all, you know, and I'm like, <laughs> you have no idea. And I was kind of freaking out a little bit, but, um, but when I saw it, like I said, I was just so excited and they looked great, they were real. I, by the time this had happened, I had had this project in my head for almost a, almost a year in my head, wandering around, thinking about these letters, thinking, oh my gosh, how are they going to look? Um, and this is how it looked. It was phenomenal. It was one of the most exciting days ever. Um, the, also, the chairman of our board was the manager of the landfill. So during the time that we were planning the letters, he would made um, pickups and picked up the litter and he stored it. And we actually got use of the landfill to fill them. We got community people come in in Louisiana, the inmates also are very important in the community. Um, the inmates collect the litter off the highway in orange bags, and they wear orange and uh, white striped suits. So orange is the color. So what you'll see here is, um, you know, the orange bags, and then they, they actually put in, in the uh, into the letters. Now, having filled them at two feet tall was one thing, but filling them at this point, we needed a lot, and I didn't realize just how much litter there was. There was hundreds of bags that were picked up over a week collectively as a community, and it took it took about 95 to 100 bags to fill the first word of pride. Um, one of the mayors wanted the word pride, and then we still had a ton of litter left. It was it's kind of sad. But, um, we we started to develop a method, you know. I mean, shoving this litter in, we were editing the litter. We took out diapers. We took out any remnants of food. Not that there is any remnants of food because there's a lot of raccoons and stuff. Um, 
but we took out we took out the uh, the liquids in the bottles and we put the bottles back in. Um, and I I mean at this point I really didn't know how heavy these things were going to go. So the frame itself is probably about 30, 40 pounds, something like that. And then when it was filled, it was getting up there. We packed it really tight. Like I said, the, the climate is really hot in, um, in Louisiana and everything expands and contracts all the time. So I knew if we didn't fill them entirely full, we would end up with um, letters that you know, had a lot of space in them. And again, it's a, it's a design thing, right? I wanted, I wanted the, lit, the litter to be like pushed into the syrups and things. So, so, so it was like, well, I'm not, it's not going to work if, if it's just straight. And then, yeah, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a disease. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so so I was there and I was around this whole thing, and I, you know, I was directing. I probably annoyed the heck out of these people. Um, but they were great, you know. I mean, they, you know, they really just took it on. I think once we got the money and once we started building stuff, and as soon as it was happening, it happened, you know. And this is one of the the great things about living in a small town community. When we started putting these on the back of the trailer and getting to the sites and realizing that something was uneven and um, not quite right, and then we got to figure out how to put them in the ground, they had the city there, they had maintenance guys there, they had trucks. They'd call them on the cell phone and within, within five minutes, there'd be like 20 different service people. Okay, what do you need? Jack hammers and all kinds of things. I mean, it was, it was you know, I started to realize the beauty of this, that small town and the skills that they had. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it was fantastic. So, um, this was installing. Um, we figured out that collectively, again, this was not something that I actually thought through that well. Uh, because I'm just thinking about the aesthetic and where they're going and what's behind them. Can I take a little picture and, and this type of stuff? But um, we ended up getting um, a foot size rebar, just literally just bending them over, driving them into the ground. Um, all of the sites that we looked at were actually on grass, so it was all dirt underneath. But for the most part, they just were driven into the ground. This right here is Lacey. Um, she always had a skirt on, I don't know. We were, we were always doing trash and she was always. So nicely dressed with the trash. Maybe she knew I was taking pictures and I was going to come to York one day. I don't know. Um, anyway, this is people kerning um, when you spacing out individual letters equally. That's called kerning, and just in the space between two characters, we use people to do that. People of the same width and height. So that's it. That's my people kerning prop right there. Um, April 2013. This was the first one that went out exactly a year to the date I sat on my, since I'd sat on my back porch and said, let's make some letters with trash with my son. Um, they were on the, right in front of the courthouse on Main Street and they caused a stir. People were, there were some interesting responses. Let's just, let's just say that. Um, most of it was just fantastic, can't believe it. Um, there was a lawyer's office that's on the other side of this. They weren't, they really weren't happy. Um, but it was a good conversation. I mean, the idea of this was not, I think it's pretty much accidental that it became art and, and people looked at it as art and they, they appreciated it and said, it's so, you know, there's some beauty in it, which like I was saying to earlier before, I said, you know, letter form to me is beautiful. What's in it is not beautiful. What's in there is a statement about what we've picked on the highway that people have dropped. So. So it's still a statement and it was, you know, at that point it was kind of like, it's not art, it's a statement. So um, so the responses I was getting were sort of all over the map. And that there's a good deal of interest, uh, not just in the community, but outside of the community. And um, people, people are candidates to come here and live in the project um, and become York residents. Um, so what happens now? The, the results of the survey are in. The first thing is that the city has to decide, does it want to proceed? And if the answer is yes, then the city and art space uh, do a little dance and we, we say, um, okay, uh, we, we will sign a pre-development contract. And the pre-development contract uh, is typically stretches out over 12 to 18 months. Uh, sometimes even longer, and the uh, the city will pay ultimately uh, $750,000, more or less, uh, for a scope of work that will be in three phases and uh, will involve 
site selection. Uh, it'll involve the hiring of an architect, and the, the preparation of all the, the working drawings, and, uh, and an application for low-income housing tax credits, which is done every September in Pennsylvania. And um, all of that will, will be done, uh, but, but in step one, it's basically the beginning. We establish the project scope. We look at, at, at building sites, buildings and sites, really, because, because as, as I said earlier, we, you know, we used to do pretty much all historic rehabilitation. Now we do a good deal of new construction. So, um, uh, so we'll look at buildings and sites. Uh, we need to obtain site control. You can't proceed if you, if you don't have the authority to, to, uh, uh, to acquire the, the, the property. So that's one of the things we, we look for early on in the process. Uh, we begin our outreach uh, to arts, uh, artists and arts organizations. We want a lot of people to know about the project obviously so that when the project opens there are people uh, who want to live there and we connect with potential partners and commercial tenants uh, who, uh, who might be interested in being in the building uh, 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 over the long haul. Prerequisites for moving forward or to the next phase of pre-development. We got to get site control. We don't, if we don't control a site we don't have anything uh, and we look for uh, strong involvement of local leadership um, and uh, I have to say that in York, uh, it's about as strong as we've ever found it. With the mission to bring all the arts to all the people all over the country. So, you know, no big deal. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, the small mission. So, you know, this is a pretty small group. I'd actually love to start by hearing a little bit more about um, the kinds of constituencies that you're representing. So I'm going to throw a few out, but we'll see. We'll see if I'm on base here. Do we have any educators, especially people from the college? Fantastic. Okay, great. How about students? Anyone from the local arts organizations? Great. Okay. Where are some others? Where are you coming from? Your city special events and your arts festival. Fantastic. Okay. Anyone else? Great, okay, and so we have some people from outside of York specifically, that's great. So today um, I'm here to talk to you ostensibly about arts and economic prosperity, but on my way into town, I saw your beautiful change sculpture, and I've heard about, uh, I've heard tell of, of frozen butter in the winter, is that true? Big butter, okay. Good, I'm not wrong. So um, I also wanted to include a couple of slides of just some wonderful art that's happening here in York. So your Chalk It Up Festival. Um, this is Wayne White, uh, an artist who I believe had a public art um, here at York College, is that right? Uh, last year, and I want you to remember this for later. This particular picture is actually of a couple from New York visiting. Um, and uh, dream right, so theater for young people as well. So these are all inspiring pictures. They tell us about what the arts do for our community. Um, so I'd like to know how many of you got into the arts because of your deep passion for economic impact. <laughs> okay, one, all right, awesome. Well, that's great. Um, most of us, not so much. Um, and we are a pragmatic nation. We are a nation built on Puritans. We are a nation that occasionally has a few people, I don't know if you've met them, some of them work in, uh, in government, some of them work in businesses, some of them even work in the arts, who don't necessarily uh, take the idea of the intrinsic value of the arts as the most um, persuasive argument about why we should be funding the arts, why the arts provide really important impact on our community. We understand their vitality. We understand why they make our communities more beautiful, more wonderful places. But I'd like to challenge you today to think about the arts a little bit differently, maybe in the way that you're already thinking about them, um, but that not all of us do. And coming up with a few new points, a few new ways of opening those doors, a new language for talking about the arts in our communities. And incorporate design thinking in a process working with a business to develop a real product and get it out into the world, um, but also working um, 
with just a community-based problem where we can bring a group of people together, teach them around a need, end with a built product, and then reflect on how that product serves the community or doesn't, and iterate. Um, so that starting from that pilot of 11,000 square feet, we'd like to, you know, we're pushing towards this dream vision. We have 50,000 square feet, a four-story building, large manufacturing space under crane. We'd like to see that corner just diagonally across from the strand become a real center um, retail space for local makers in the community, community education space, um, business mentorship, and I'd like to see a cafe and some other gathering areas just so the general public can engage and, and you know have a way to get into the space and start to see how they might be a part of it or just enjoy being around it and seeing what comes out. Um, so, questions for you to consider or what would you do there? Kelly is a dynamo. If anybody. Yeah. <laughs> All of you guys in York in Louisiana when I was trying to get this off the ground because it was um, a lot more difficult. Um, but yeah, so so uh, you guys did the vote and put um, you went out to public vote, which is what I wanted initially when I first started this project was to you know survey the community. What do you want to say? What is what is what do you want to say out there? And what do you want? You know, how do you want to have an impact on this project? Use it in any way you want, but but ask tons of people and that's exactly what Kelly did. Um, Kelly and everyone in the Cultural Alliance and all the partners Keep Your Beautiful, they um, they invited me on the conference calls when you guys were making the letters here so that again was uh, um, you know I, I was honored to do that and, and you know it was really interesting to be on the conference call but step aside and see how you guys work together because ultimately the project is pretty much the same in every community, but it's been used differently and different kinds of people have worked on it. So again, it, you know, still on the um, study head of mine. Um, so Kelly is on many, many pictures. Um, I believe it was pouring rain last week and cold and, um, and um, you guys uh, got this, you got this done. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm still amazed and I'm still humbled by anyone who gets this done, you know? There's a lot of people who talk about doing things and want to do things and have always wanted and just don't know how, but people get these done. And I do want to point out that it's a lot of women getting these done. <laughs> just saying, just saying. Um, we need the guys, we really need them, but part, you know, spearheading these things and, 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 and organizing communities and finding out how it's done and putting it in a, putting it in a place and collecting litter and, and trying to involve as much community as you can with all ages of the community. It's hard work, right? It's not, this is not something that takes five minutes, it takes months. So, so but ultimately we're all the same, you know, we're all the same kind of people. Everyone I've spoken to in every single state, we think we're different, but we're all the same. We all want the same things. We all want our kids to be in a community that's clean and tidy and, and picked up. And we all want everybody to, you know, take some responsibility. So this may, may or may not be a solution to that, but it's, a, it's an effort. It's an example. It's something, it's, it's an idea, like I said, that, that came from some random conversations and um, has now touched hundreds of people. I've had their hands on this. And as a designer, I truly believe that you put your hands on something, you're emotionally invested in it. You know, everyone that's, that's picked up litter, that's wrapped this wire, that's been involved in the welding, that's even talked about it in a meeting, that's got involved in the installation, that said yes, people that have said no. They're all invested some way in this. And I don't think, you know, this has been a life-changing, um, a life-changing project for me because I, I've never thought about art and design and thinking that way and it's really really powerful this is you know like I said it's gone from me and this quirky idea in this little little tiny town in Louisiana and look what's happened so this is really this is probably <laughs> half of the people because the great thing about people that work on these projects are so humble they won't give me everyone's name you know I mean there's hundreds of kids there's hundreds of people behind the behind this list that um, have had a part in this. But like you said, these are the um, shout outs right now that I do have my website that I will keep I will keep adding on. Um, and this is my final. I know I'm trying to rush. <laughs> um, this is um, you know 
finale. I mean, I say finale, but it's not. I mean, this is this is like an ongoing thing. In Louisiana, we are, um, we you know, as of as have been out like a year now. So we're emptying out now, and we're moving them around to different locations. We're giving them schools, and we're letting them use them in in educational purposes. Or you know, I'd initially considered or, or really wanted them to sit out on, the, on a particular highway that was very littered, empty, and then daily have everyone use it as a trash can. Um, so um, I've been talking to some, some states that are really interested in doing that with the school environment. So, so I hope to see that in the next few months too. A um, uh, couple of things. Um, Tennessee um, love the project so much, they're going to debut a word every single year. So that's kind of like their program in the school now. Um, I'm also talking with Abilene, Texas, and um, the state of um, Baton Rouge in Louisiana. So, so that, like I said, this you know, this this really just started as a small idea, just a way to approach something differently, involve all aspects of the community, and um, try it. Right? I mean, try it and see what happens. Time will tell. A lot of people come up to me and say, "Well, as it, as it reduced the litter, maybe." Maybe not, but I know that it's touched the people that have worked on it, and the friends of them, and the schools, and um, and and the idea. Um, like I said, I'm at this point now where I am sort of surveying everyone and asking them a bunch of questions about what's happening now. You know, I'm not I'm not ready to walk away from this and see. You know, what happened six months from now? Did it change? And the majority of responses I've had have said people have been so proud to have worked on something. You know, the eight-year-old and the fifteen-year-old and the grandparent has never done an art project in their life, and they work, they work on it, and they drive by and they see how, you know, they worked on it, they own it. So, um, so yeah, I'm, I'm just just want to wrap up to say um, it's a shame I don't live in York, Pennsylvania. Yeah. <laughs> you have a bad city. Something's burning. I got a little pain, I need to digest Gotta get freedom down in my soul I gotta get glad, I gotta get whole I have a few things I need to figure out I may need to scream, I may need to shout Gotta feel joy down in my heart And put back together all these broken parts Thank you.
We hope you enjoyed our mini trip through the Impact Arts Conference as presented by the Cultural Alliance of York. Thank you so much to our liaison at the Cultural Alliance, Kelly Gibson, and to all the wonderful staff there and at York College who made this incredible conference possible. Now don't forget, the Impact Arts Conference will be happening again in the summer of 2015. So we need to make sure that you are there taking part of it. The business of art is what makes the joy of art possible. So let's celebrate both. Thank you for celebrating art with us this week here on Culture in Maine. Make sure to find us on Facebook, Twitter, or online at wrct.tv. And always feel free to email us, cultureinmaine at gmail.com, and let us know what you thought. And we will see you right here again next week on the corner of Culture in Maine. I'm really excited about this. I love the atmosphere. I just want to know more about it. I see it uh, evolving, changing, growing. Once it happens, once a song comes out, once a poem comes out, it'll never come out the same. The my culture of Maine is documenting what's going on in a way that will have that lasting staying power. It just breeds health growth. It's, it's just it's a necessity. It's, it's, it's a necessity, yes.